Throughout the late 70s and the early 80s, this band was on fire. Between the US and the UK, they had 14 top 20 hits. For a while, they were easily the biggest band in the world. Today, we're checking in on one of their highest charting hits and one of their best songs. It almost never happened. Seems to happen a lot in music. Uh, the song was ignored by two of the three band members for years. So the lead singer, he finally recorded it in secret. And he steamrolled them and got it on the new album after missing out on the previous three. And it alienated them. And even though it became a monster hit, it ultimately caused a rift that ended the band. It's a compelling story about a song that the singer believed in so much, he searched for the perfect rhyme for a word in the chorus for years. The song is definitely magic, and the story's coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you had a Levi jacket with band pins all over it, you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now, click the bell so that you can always jump in the time machine with us every single day. We also have a Patreon. You're gonna to wanna to check that out. You can become an honorary producer and help us to, to create this content. You, we give you more content as well. So it's time for another edition of Number One in Our Hearts, one of my favorite shows on here. Uh, it's a show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100. But for whatever reason, be it radio play, lack of marketing, label support, or just stupidity, the song came up short. Today, we're bringing you the story of one of my favorite songs ever. It's a song that sat in cold storage for years. It actually missed out on this band's first three albums. They only had five albums uh, as a band. Uh, when it finally got its chance, it almost went all the way to the top of the charts, but it came up just short. At the time, it was the band's biggest song, though, and opened the door for their mega number one hit that would follow. I'm talking about Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic by The Police. So although Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic was released as uh, the second single off The Police's fourth album, Ghost in the Machine, great record, uh, its origins actually predate the formation of the police in 1977. Uh, having been written by Sting in the fall of 1976 before he moved to London and joined forces with Mike Howlett. Every little thing she does is magic. For those of you who are not familiar, Mike Howlett formed the short-lived band Strontium 90 in uh, 1977, which included the ranks of the police, uh, Sting, Stuart Copeland, and Andy Summers. Hallett performed most of the lead vocals. He played bass and was the primary songwriter. Uh, and together, the foursome recorded several demos. But they disbanded when Andy left to join Stuart and Sting's other project, which was called The Police. Sting recorded the demo for Every Little Thing uh, She Does His Magic by himself. He used equipment in the loft of Hallett's home in Acton, uh, London. Originally an acoustic ballad, it also included bass guitar, uh, African drums and had a, a bossa nova style to it. Everything she do just turn me on, even though my but try as he might, Gordon Sumner or Sting, he couldn't convince Copeland and Summers to cut the song for the police. At least not for the first three albums anyway. Both the drummer and the guitarist, they were wary of the track, especially since they wanted uh, cred with the London punk community. The song, in their opinion, was just too blasted soft. Was now I know my love for her. Sting was frustrated because he knew it was a hit. He knew it was a good song. So uh, fast forward to 1981. The police were on the rise. They had transcended the London punk scene and were growing into a formidable band. Releasing an album per year dating back to uh, 1978, they were steadily taking over the world of pop, rock, and new wave. From Roxanne, to Message in a Bottle, to Don't Stand So Close to Me, The Police released some of the most undeniably catchy songs of the late 70s and early 80s. Oh, if it's right, But Ghosts in the Machine as a whole, it would be a radical departure from their previous offerings. Its name came from Arthur Kessler's book of the same name, uh, which explores the dichotomy between mind and body. 
Now, lyrically, the album it was more philosophical and more political than ever before, addressing some serious global themes. They started to do that on um, previous albums, but they really went after it here. Uh, amongst all of its deeper tracks, though, the song that stood out the most was a love song. Every little thing she does is magic. Though thematically, it was a simple pop love song. It had the ear-catching commercial appeal to dominate the charts around the world. The police opted to record Ghost in the Machine at George Martin's studio in Montserrat in the Caribbean. Producer Hugh Padgham, he took the reins as producer. And uh, the album took about six weeks to record altogether. It started in June of 1981. And along with the new ideas it proposed, new sounds emerged as well, including Sting on the saxophone. Other changes to the police dynamic were visual. For the first time on the cover, you could read a police album title in English while simultaneously not seeing uh, the band's faces. Well, technically they were there, only uh, each of their faces was a computerized image. Sting described their cover as showing their three faces transposed into digital images, red LED lights on a black background. Uh, in his words, they were the ghosts in the machine. If you couldn't tell, Sting's in the middle, you know, with the spiky hair. I always thought that it looked like an alarm clock from the 80s, you know, one of those digital alarm clocks that we all used. Ghosts in the Machine would make a strong showing on the US charts, but ultimately it came up just short of the top spot. It reached number two. That was a shortfall the band vowed to fix with their next album, and of course they would. Synchronicity would go to number one, and it would be the biggest selling album of their career, one of the biggest of that year and of the 80s, platinum times eight in the US. For its part, Ghost of the Machine wouldn't do too, too bad either. It sold three million albums in the US and it offered up four strong singles and Invisible Sun, Spirits in the Material World, Secret Journey, and today's featured song, Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. As we get further into this video, I want to thank Clear, who is sponsoring this segment today. You know, my health has been upgraded over the last few months since I learned more about the importance of both oral and nasal hygiene with Clear. It's amazing how much better I breathe and feel, especially after washing my nose with Clear Nasal Care and brushing with Sprite toothpaste each morning and night. You know, most visits to primary care doctors, they're caused by sickness in the nose and the mouth, which is why creating habits of good hygiene is so important. Brushing with Sprite toothpaste, chewing Sprite gum, and washing my nose with clear because they all contain xylitol, the natural sugar that blocks bacteria and viruses and helps your body wash them away. Clear is the solution. Click on the link below and leave us a comment on Amazon to let us know about your experience. Start brushing with Sprite and washing your nose with clear today. But getting to this peak of massive success would leave the band with some lasting scars, the police. There would be some serious repercussions that would follow them into their next album and uh, spell doom for the band, ultimately sowing the seeds of their breakup after synchronicity. Sting, the mad musical genius that he is, was becoming disaffected with his bandmates' contributions. As a consequence, the demos he brought to the table, they weren't really demos at all. They were all but finished tracks. Uh, this was a violation of a pact that the three band members had made or at least Summers and Copeland believed that they made. Uh, on previous albums, it was police policy to toss out the demo arrangements each band member made so that they could you know, remake the songs into the band's collective style. But when Sting presented his work for Ghosts in the Machine to the band, Copeland said that he had done so much homework that there's not much room for new ideas here. Increasingly, Sting also vetoed the demos turned in by the other bandmates, the other two. At this point, Summers aptly called the studio a canvas for dirty fighting. <laughs> Reportedly, they would all hang over the faders in the control room just to make sure that their respective parts didn't get erased from the mix. There was a lot of fighting going on there. Out of the 11 tracks selected for the final cut of the album, Copeland and Summers would have only three writing credits between them. And uh, nothing in the way of singles. It was the beginning of Sting's solo push 
and the ending of Andy and Stewart's creative contributions to the band, in effect. But Sting, of course, he had a different outlook. He described the process for Ghost in the Machine like this. Before we come together for an album, each of us goes into a studio of our own. I wrote 10 songs for this album, and with a drum box, piano, bass, and guitar, I put down the arrangements as I saw them, as best I could. If they were satisfactory to the group, that's what we played. If they could be bettered, well, I'm proud to say that in a lot of cases, the arrangements I came up with at the demo stage arrived on record. You know, in not so subtle words, Sting simply believed the material that he brought was better. As for every little thing she does is magic, well, that was another part of Sting's coup and a maddening addition to the album for his bandmates, for sure. Before even meeting up in Montserrat, uh, Sting had already worked up a second demo of the song with a uh, French-Canadian keyboardist named Jean Roussel. Uh, that was in January of 1981 at La Studio, just north of uh, Montreal, Canada. Sting said that the demo was really great. It sounded like a number one song to his ears. In Montserrat, uh, Sting presented the demo to the band, but getting the magic into every little thing, that would prove difficult for the rest of the band. According to Sting, Summers and Copeland were reticent. They still thought it was soft, believing that the track's arrangement just wasn't close enough to the police's style. Andy and Stewart tried to policify it, if you will. Now, they tried out various arrangements and styles for days on end. Said Copeland about it, we tried it fast, we tried it slow, uh, we tried it reggae, we tried it punk, we tried it as a bossa nova. We tried every which way, but nothing. To the extent that we did it different from the demo was the extent to which it didn't sound like a hit anymore. End of quote. They were just completely frustrated, but just as completely stubborn. Stuart and Andy didn't want to give Sting the satisfaction of bringing in an all-but-finished hit song. Now, ultimately, Sting flew... Uh, Jean down to Montserrat to help re-record the track, though he was the only member of the police who wanted him there. <laughs> Summers, in particular, you know, he was skeptical of infusing keyboards into the police's sound. Now, to be sure, Jean's keyboard parts did really help, but the band was still at odds over the song. According to Copeland, by the fifth day, they'd given up on everything. Feeling particularly pissed off, he asked himself, what the hell are we going to do? Finally, at this point, Sting prevailed on Stewart to just play the track like it sounded on the demo. However, Copeland would claim that it was his idea. He remembered telling Padgham, you know, the producer, to punch in his demo, uh, or to punch in the demo one morning so that he could play over it to prove just how crummy it was. And as Stewart sat down at the kit, Sting stood over him and waved him through all of the changes. Seething with anger, Stewart easily managed it in just one take, which is the track that ended up on the record. So instead of Copeland you know, proving his point, the exact opposite happened. And he had to begrudgingly admit that it finally sounded right. Next up, it was Andy Summers who did the exact same thing on the guitar. You know, looking back, Stuart Copeland said, you know, we just faced the music. We bit the bullet, and we used Sting's arrangements in his demo. Damn. <laughs> the resulting cut was a peric victory for Copeland and Summers. It was just a slap in the face. Their input into the song had been minimal at best, particularly for Summers, whose guitar work was all but lost in the whole mix. Practically downgraded uh, to becoming Sting's session henchman, really. The knife, it twisted even further when every little thing she does is magic became a global smash and the band's biggest selling single to date. Uh, the finished song was a turning point for band relations and it was a significant victory for Sting's solo-minded approach. It helped to establish his primacy over bandmates, though I would argue at a great cost by violating their agreement to collectively work out you know, the tracks together as a band, Sting more or less, and for better or worse, set in motion the extinction of the police. Oh, 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 
as I mentioned before, lyrically, every little thing she does is magic. It's a love song, although it's a pretty one-sided love song. <laughs> Singh opens by explaining how he's tried to tell this girl about his feelings for her. But every time he's close to her, he completely loses his nerve. It's not clear whether or not she knows how he feels, but you know he's clearly struggling here with the words, with the feelings, the emotions. Then in the second verse, Sting sings, do I have to tell the story of a thousand rainy days since we first met? It's a poetic description that captures the prolonged agony that he's going through, pining after this girl, you know? There really is no sunshine in his life without her. There hasn't been for a long time. Next comes the classic line, it's a big enough umbrella, but it's always me that ends up getting wet. I love that, so good. Uh, so good that Sting would use it in future compositions. Oh my God, in seven days. But ultimately, Sting's whole tortured predicament is perfectly highlighted by the song's insanely catchy chorus. Actually, though, Sting had some trouble coming up with a word to rhyme with magic. Obviously, he went with tragic, but he actually wanted something else. As Stuart Copeland recalled, he said, I remember Sting for years trying to think of a rhyme for magic. I think the only word he could come up with apart from tragic was pelagic, which means ocean going. Uh, there I was in my leather pants, my punk hairdo, pondering the distinction between ocean going and river going fish. That just cracks me up. It's probably a good thing that Sting went with tragic. Fragic, stagic, dagic, lagic. I mean, there's not a, there's just not a word, a word that exists unless he made it up. That's funny. And, and he did. I read about this. He struggled with this for years. Probably didn't use a rhyming dictionary. Like I said before, this is my all-time favorite police song ever. I mean, it's exactly what the title says it is. It's magic. The bass line alone, it makes your hair stand on end. I mean, it's never been clear who the muse was that Sting wrote this song for, but as much as any pop song that's ever been recorded, this song has to have been inspired by the perfect woman. This is not a second best song, a song about a second best. This is a song uh, that's for a goddess of all goddesses. To be honest with you, this is the song that I measure my significant other by. If I couldn't listen to this song and have it describe my companion to the T, I just have to keep searching. It's the song that true love should be measured by, no question. And the end of the song, you know, the band's just jamming and Sting is just wailing. It's just pure joy. As much joy as I've ever heard on a pop song. It's truly an inspired work. Now, the music video for Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic, that was directed by Derek Burbage, and it filmed in Montserrat uh, it was during the summer of 81. The video alternates between scenes from the recording studio with scenes shot outdoors with a local crowd, uh, who Copeland said couldn't have been less interested in what they were doing. But what really has gone down in history as the most memorable part of the video is uh, the band's in-studio antics. I mean, in the video, you can catch the trio messing around with the studio equipment and dancing like madmen around the control room. Pretty fun to watch, actually. However, the fun uh, that they were having, it did raise a few eyebrows, especially when Andy Summers walked across one of the most advanced and expensive pieces of recording equipment in the world at that time. Actually, in the book MTV Ruled the World, the early years of music video, Copeland talks about the fallout from their control room uh, mischief. 
He said that they didn't think that they were trashing the console at all. We were in the habit because we were all very fit of climbing over it because it was very long. And if you were over there and you wanted to get over here to hit a fader or something, you know, we just climb over it. Certainly, we were not cognizant of any abuse of the console, but you know, we're just dancing around. Broken consoles or not, every little thing she does is magic. It was a big winner all across the world, starting in the US where it became the band's biggest hit today. It reached number three on the Hot 100. Uh, that happened on December 5th of 1981. It would stay there for two weeks. It also climbed to number six on the Cashbox chart and it went to number one on the mainstream rock chart. Uh, though for uh, our purposes here, that's not really the number one we're looking for. Uh, internationally though, it came in at number 15 in Finland, number 12 in South Africa, number seven in New Zealand, number five in Norway. It went to number three in Belgium, number two in Australia and Italy. And it went to number one in Ireland, Canada, the Netherlands, and the UK, where it would be one of five number ones for the band. Since then, every little thing she does is magic has appeared in several movies and TV shows. Uh, there was The Wedding Singer, Bewitched, The Office, Sabrina, The Teenage Witch, The Goldbergs, Everybody Hates Chris, and Top Gear. You know, frankly, I'm actually shocked it hasn't been used more. It's just so breathtakingly cinematic, this song. Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. It's also been covered by Sean Colvin. Elvis Costello, John Mayer, Sister Hazel, uh, Brian Vander Ark, The African Wigs, Blues Traveler, uh, Dido. <laughs> And recently, Stuart Copeland teamed up with the Foo Fighters and John Theodore to play this song at the Taylor Hawkins Tribute Concert. So getting back to making this song number one in our hearts, well, you know, let's take a look at what two songs kept it out of the top spot on the Hot 100. I like to do this. Uh, in at number two was Foreigner, Waiting for a Girl Like You. just ahead of it was Olivia Newton-John's uh, Freight Train Number no. 1, Physical, spent 10 weeks at the top of the Hot 100. Biggest song of the 80s, actually. You know I love Olivia Newton-John, but do you know how many great songs were deprived of the number one spot because of this damn song? Here's a smattering. Don't stop Some of the greatest songs ever. With 10 weeks at number one, I think we can definitely give one of those weeks to the police and another one of those weeks to Foreigner. Of course, the police would grab the top spot a couple of years later with Every Breath You Take. Every breath you take. But with the greatness this band gifted to the world, there's no doubt in my mind, they deserve at the very least two number one hits in America. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about the police and every little thing she does is magic. What do you remember about this song? What do you think about the song? How does it hit you? One of the greatest love songs ever. What are your thoughts? What does it remind you of? Let's have a great discussion below. Uh, what do you think? Was, was Sting right to do what he did? Do you like the police or Sting solo better? What do you think their next albums would have sounded like had they stayed together? I think we've got fodder for a great discussion below. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.